Come on, church. There is no other king than King Jesus, and he is alive. Amen? Amen. Happy Easter, everybody. So glad you guys decided to join us for Easter at Discovery. Man, I just get so stoked over what God has done. I think about what he's done over the last little over four years now we started Discovery, and now four campuses across two cities, 1,300 people meeting weekly for worship. Guys, it's just the beginning. I mean, you know, God is good. Amen? Yeah. Although we're kind of um, uh, fairly still a young church, um, we've created some traditions already, some traditions, and one of them happens to be this card that you got when you came in. Can everyone pull out this card right here? This card, this Easter survey, go ahead and take that out. Um, we, we like to do, we have this tradition of doing an Easter survey. There's a few questions and feedback that we want to get from you. So if you're part of the family here at Discovery, take that out. Even if you're new, join along with us. We'd love for you to um, give us some feedback and let us know what you think on some of these things. Um, uh, and the reason why, some people ask, like, hey, why do we do this on Easter? Well, this is the day that all of you decide to attend church on the same Sunday. So... There's no other Sunday like this for all of you. Anyway, but it's just, I, I, no one's going to come knocking on your door or anything like that. The front side is just like the connection card, your information. The back side has some prayer requests. If you want to get any information to me or prayer, uh, I'd love to pray for any of your needs. That's, you can put that there. But let me draw your attention to where it says questionnaire. There's a few questions I want to start the service, then we're going to get into this Easter message we prepared for you today. The first uh, question we're interested in knowing is, are you interested in helping start Discovery Church Northwest? We are starting a campus of Discovery Church in Northwest Bakersfield, and that'll be launched later this year. The location is to be determined, but we're in the planning and uh, pre-launch phase of that campus. And if you want to be possibly a part of it or, or just maybe get more information about that campus as we continue to prepare and have information gatherings, check that box off. We would in, we'll include you on that information as we as we meet and draw closer to the Discovery Church Northwest launch date. The second question on there is about Discovery Church Southwest, and that one says, Am I, are you interested in helping us start a Sunday evening, 6 p.m. service here at Southwest Campus of Discovery Church? So we've been growing and growing and growing, and we're at four services, and in the trend of growth, uh, just we're going to need to open up another opportunity for people to come uh, to Discovery, and so that 6 p.m. evening service is coming. We don't know, don't have a date uh, for you to announce just yet, but if you're interested in being a part of that, we're going we're gonna to launch this Sunday evening service kind of like a campus launch. We're going to gear up for it, promote it, just get excited about another opportunity people can come to Discovery Church. So there's a few questions a part of that on that, on that survey is if you would be interested in, in you know, helping us be part of the dream team for six months. And commit to six months serving as part of the help start and lead the 6 p.m. service. Check that box off. Or then the other question is, is about attending. Would you, be, would you consider it committing to attend the 6 p.m. service for six months? So what we're doing is trying to get 80 to 100 people to commit to both serving and attending the 6 p.m. service so we can launch that successfully. Sound good, church? Amen? Amen. All right, go ahead and tuck that card away. We'll come back to that. In just a moment, you guys, um, we've been for the last several weeks here at Discovery Church studying the most important days of all of history, these three days of Jesus' life, the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That good for the, but Traditionally, that Friday is called Good Friday, where Jesus died on the cross, his, his burial and resurrection. We've been studying these days because... Um, the Bible actually tells us that this is the most important events in all history and, and in Jesus' life happened in these three days. So, so what we've been studying is what did Jesus accomplish in those three days and what, did it, what does it mean for us? What can we learn from that? And so I want to I wanna recap this, this verse and recap this, the, the, where we're at because the third day only makes sense, or let me say it this way, it makes better sense and, has, and it's magnified to its full potential when you understand it in its context of what, of what happened in all the three days. So let's go to this verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And it says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. And in, in the, the New Testament was written in Greek. And so this, this portion of the Bible, like when it was originally penned, was Greek. And that word that I highlighted there as first importance 
um, is the word protos in Greek. And that, that word means first or supreme or superior. It literally means nothing else even comes close. So that's, it's just what Paul is saying here, the author of 1 Corinthians, what he's saying is, man, this is a priority in your life. Like nothing else comes close to all of your searching, all of your studying, all of your growing. Nothing comes close. Nothing takes priority. Nothing is more supreme than what Jesus did and what it means for you on these three days. And here they are. He said that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scripture, that this is protos. So in, in day one, the death, we studied, you know, uh, what did Jesus accomplish on that day? What does it mean for us? Well, w- what he accomplished was he paid for your sins. He paid for our sin debt. He, he, by sacrificing himself on the cross, the, sin, the, the debt of sin has been paid for. So we are free in Christ. And not only that, we've been given a new spirit. But we ask this question, um, pose the question in week one and day one and studying Friday, what do you do in, when, in your own life when you feel like you're dying on the inside, when you're going through a suffering like Christ had that Good Friday experience in the day of his crucifixion? What do you, what do, you do in, in, your, in your times and seasons of suffering that can breathe life back into you? Okay, so that's what we studied in day one. In day two, the burial which is Friday into Saturday in, in the gospel narrative there, the burial of Jesus, we studied that. And, it, and although it doesn't look like, like it doesn't look like things are happening, Jesus is behind the tomb, he's buried, there's not a lot of movement going on or activity, but in the spirit realm, what we learn is that what Jesus accomplished for us, he actually went to the pits of hell and grabbed the keys of death and, and from Satan and the, the keys of death in Hades from Satan himself, that although it didn't look like things, things were happening or moving, that spiritually behind the scenes, while we were waiting, God was working. And so we asked that question of, well, what is it? What do you do when it doesn't look like, you know, the way you thought it should look like? What do you do when it doesn't feel right? It doesn't look right when you're in this waiting period, because none of the disciples thought Jesus was going to die. None of the disciples thought that Jesus was going to be buried. So what do we do in the waiting game? What do we do when we're put in the delay seasons of life where it just it brings confusion and sometimes even frustration? So we answer that question in day two. But today is day three. It's Resurrection Sunday. He is alive. He is risen. He is risen indeed. What did he, okay, well, what did Jesus do? What did he accomplish for us? We know, we, we study what he accomplished in, in the death. We, we, what did he accomplish even in the delay when it looked like nothing was happening, but he was accomplishing something. Now, what did he accomplish on day three? And I want to give you a simple thought of today's message, a thought that can revolutionize your life. I'm telling you that if you, it, it can make it to where Easter 2018 was the most memorable experience of your life if you can grab hold of this truth. And here's the truth. Here's the simple thought I want to kind of, you know, pitch to you today. And that is that Easter really, it really isn't about Jesus getting up out of the grave. Huh? Right? You know what? Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it's not really just about with all the power of heaven on his side that Jesus conquered death and rose from the grave, you need to understand that that was just an example of what he wanted Easter to be like, and that was he wanted you to get up out of the grave. He wanted you to experience a resurrection. He did that so that every one of us trapped in our sin, bound up, tied up, you know, held back, dying and buried, could experience resurrection power. That's the true meaning of Easter. So I want you to write it, write it down this way to contextualize the thought of where we're going today. And that is, you gave, we gave you some sermon notes. If you got those notes, you can take notes along with us. Write it down. Here it is. We not only can celebrate the resurrection. We, we can not only celebrate Easter, but we can experience it. Man, you can have your own Easter resurrection experience today. You don't have to just attend a resurrection service where we go, Oh, wow. Good job, Jesus, man. He, he's the man. Whoa, 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 go, Jesus. No, no, no. I mean, it's all that and so much more. I want you to know today that you are a candidate for God to do something powerful in your life, for God to resurrect things that may be dead and shoved off to the side in your life. But here's the 
reality, you guys. I call it the Easter effect. Like there's, because of Easter, because of the resurrection, some things, it, some things are made available and accomplished for you and me. But the reality is a lot of people don't experience the resurrection power. A lot of people, they get so caught up in the day one and day two experiences in the deaths and delays of life that they never see the deliverance of God. We just get sidetracked. We get, we, get, we get off focus. You see, in the middle of the sufferings and the waiting periods of life, we, we look to substitutes instead of the Savior. And we substitute Jesus and we substitute his plan. And we can get caught in what I'm calling today the substitution sequence. And it's a sequence of events and choices that we make that we're all too familiar with. No one likes going through day one and day two. No one likes suffering and trials and tribulation and and delays and waiting periods where you can't understand what God is doing. It doesn't look like he's accomplishing anything. No one likes those experiences, but those are what's necessary to walk through to resurrection. And I'm telling you, when we get through this, we're all too familiar, and it's robbing us of operating the power of the resurrection, the substitution sequence. And it's, and it's our human nature, by the way, to want to you know, move away from day one and day two experiences. I put it in your notes, Luke chapter 22, verse 42, just to show you that Jesus himself looked for a substitute. In his, in his day one, day two kind of experience, Jesus, now look, Jesus was both fully God and fully man. The Bible says that he was tempted in all manners like we are tempted. He had the same feelings that you and I, fe- that you and I feel. And in his humanity, in his human nature, this God man cried out, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Like I'm tapping out. Can I get a substitute? All right, this is in his Thursday experience. Jesus is right before he's going to be handed over to be persecuted, flogged, whipped, marred beyond recognition. And he, is, he knows this. He's seeing ahead of it, and he's saying, I, can I get a substitute? Has anyone ever been there where you're like, God, I don't know if I can go any further. I don't know if I can take it anymore. I don't, I don't think I can handle what you're putting on me. And we look to substitutes instead of the Savior. So let me give you this substitution sequence. And there are three Three steps, really, and I've seen it as a, as a minister now for many years that people take these substitutes instead of the Savior. And this is what it looks like. This is the first step. Take some notes with me, you guys. The first step of the substitution sequence is that we choose our way. We choose our way. I mean, we see God's, God's way, and we're like, okay, so I, I'll take your resurrection power. I mean, I want, the, I want that anointing and power, you know, and when, you need, when I need you in my life and to come with power, I'd like that. But when it comes to this day one, day two stuff, you know, I'll just, I'll take back control, okay, because I'd rather, I'd rather not go through. And I think we have the wrong idea that if God is in something, then it's going to be easy. I mean, you know, easier isn't always better. It's not always better. And so some of us think like when I'm comfortable, that means I'm in God's will. And when I'm uncomfortable, I must be out of God's will. God doesn't want me to be uncomfortable. He doesn't lead me into uncomfort. Yes, he does. God has a long-standing habit of leading those he loves into difficult seasons. And why does he do that? Thank God he does that because he's more interested in your character than he is your comfort. He's developing you. It is, it is God's will that you will go through day one and day two because he's working in your life. We want resurrection power without the burial. We want the prize without the price. We want success without the process. We want, someone said, we want the desert without the desert. Man, I thought that was funny, man. It's true, this human nature, and it's in the process, listen, of obedience, that character is formed. It's in the process of trust that your faith is developed, and the most painful part of the process will also produce the most power in your life. It's the process, the process, and we try to abandon the process and choose our own way. John chapter 6, starting at verse 60, it says this, that many of Jesus' disciples said, this is a hard This is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Jesus said some hard truths, some difficult things. Jesus is, he he led people into, into just difficult things. And it says at that point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. 
Like, I don't like where you're leading me. I don't like what that looks like. I didn't quite sign up for this. You know, I'd rather, and they just, that's why Jesus says later on in the Gospels, he says, uh, narrow is the road that leads to life. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in threat. But narrow is that road that leads to my, to life. Proverbs chapter 16 says, there is a way that seems right to a man. I mean, it seems right. I mean, God wants me happy. God wants, God wants me comfortable. I mean, it seems right. It seems right. But in the end, it says that way is death. So we're not seeing the season. We're not seeing day one and day two like God sees day one and day two. And maybe that's why we're not walking in resurrection power is because you keep abandoning in day one and day two. Maybe you're not seeing the power of God in your marriage, in your career, in your ministries, in your life. Because am I preaching too hard for you right now, church? All right. That's what, I mean, we're just not. The, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. You're not thinking like me. He says, actually, he says, as far as the heavens are from the earth, so are my thoughts and your thoughts and my ways and your ways. And we choose our way. We substitute God's ways for ours. And I'm telling you, we do that. It never works. It just it just never works. It ends in destruction. Things start to fall apart. And some of you have experienced that personally. You've experienced going your way, choosing your plan over God's, and you have watched important things, things you value, slip between your fingers. Relationships that, that you value, that you care for, that because you chose your own way, they start to just, you're losing grip on the things that are most important in your life. And I'm telling you, listen, in every step of this substitution sequence, we have the opportunity to turn and choose Christ. To t- in that opportunity, you know what? I can, I can turn. If you're in that place today where you've chosen your own way and you've seen the result, the, 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 the results, it just doesn't work out and it never does. If, if, if you have the opportunity today to turn, but if you do not, you move on to the second step of the substitution sequence. And that is, write it down this way, we blame others. Because it doesn't work out, never does. It's got to be someone's fault. It sure ain't mine. <laughs> ain't my fault. Have you ever, how many ever played the blame game? Come on. A lot of people don't like to admit that they, you know, they played that game before, but most of us have, at least at some time or another, found a scapegoat, right? Found someone to throw underneath the bus, right? You, and, and so most people don't like to admit it, and especially they don't like to admit it when we have a habit of blaming others for our own mistakes. Um, this, this game originated with Adam in the Garden of Eden, and mankind has been trying to perfect it ever since. We have, and so the truth is we don't like to admit it when we're wrong, especially when we're caught being wrong. It's always someone else's fault or something else's fault, someone or something. So you get pulled over for a ticket, right? And you go, I was just trying to go with the flow of traffic, Officer Ryan, I mean, every time, I just go with the flow of traffic. How come that guy ahead of me, he was the rabbit leader. How come he's going faster than me, right? Or, or you say, well, I didn't see the sign, that, that speed chain sign. There was a branch covering the sign. It ain't my fault. It's someone else's fault. It's something else's fault. Or, or you know what? I wouldn't get so angry if she didn't make me angry. That's why. He makes me angry. That's why I say, I, I, man, I said what I said, or I did what I did, or I threw something across the room because she, he, they made me angry. That's why. It's always someone else's fault. Or, or when I like as a pastor, when I, well, I don't go to church because people, church people, well, it's the blame game. It's the blame game because we chose our own way and our way doesn't work out. It ain't working out. And it's got to be someone's fault. So it's someone, it just got, it's someone else's fault. And we blame. Proverbs 28 says, you will never succeed in life if you hide your mistakes. If you hide your sins, you'll, ne- you'll never succeed. Confess them and give them up. Then God will show you mercy. Listen, please listen. You start healing when you stop blaming. That's what that says right there. You start the healing process whenever you stop blaming. When we constantly make excuses for ourselves, listen, we short circuit the work that God intends to do in our lives because we're spending so much time and energy trying to minimize our mistakes rather than confess and turn them over to God. Always obey the Lord and you will be happy. If you're stubborn, though, you'll be ruined. You know what the, some, of, some of the hardest three words you will ever have to say? You want to know what they are? I was wrong. 
That's a tough pill to swallow for some people. Did, uh, I was wrong. It's so easy to point out the wrong in others. It's so easy to want it to be someone else's fault. It's easy to get critical and to get cynical, caught up in our limited perspective. But it's, man, it is so hard to see where we went wrong, where we need to own up. And if we don't spot it, if we don't spot that we're in the blame game, uh, you're going to end up moving to this, the final and the most critical step in the substitution sequence. And that is we are consumed by guilt. And this is such a destructive place to be because the, this is one of the, one of the uh, tools of the enemy to crush you. The enemy's plan for your life is to steal, kill, and destroy your life, your purpose, your value. And this is one of the tools, it's his, one of his favorite tools in, in, in his arsenal is to bury you with guilt. But listen, God is always ready to give you another chance, church. I want you to hear that. It is a bedrock principle of our faith because we've all been irresponsible. We've all messed up. We've all made mistakes. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20 says, not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. Hey, if you're a little messed up today, you're in good company. Come on, somebody. We are, everyone here is a little messed up, has made some mistakes, has been irresponsible. There is no one who's good all the time and who never sins. And God does not want you living under that heavy guilt trip about all the mistakes of your life. Guilt destroys your confidence. It ruins your relationships. It gets you stuck in the past. It even destroys your health. I was reading a while back a, a report that said 70% of people in hospitals could get up and walk out if they just knew how to resolve their guilt issues. It's, it's just so destructive to the human condition. And God has something so much better for you. Listen, you don't have to live with guilt. God wants you to live with promise and hope. God can even bring good out of those dumb decisions that we've made. That's just how awesome God is, man. If we turn to God and give him those things. There are three truths I want you to know about this. These aren't even in your notes, but I just want to give them to you. One, God forgives you instantly. Like the moment you turn, the moment you confess, God chooses to forgive you right there. You don't have to do nothing for it. Number two, God forgives you freely. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. Neither do I. It is free. And lastly, God forgives completely. He wipes your sins out absolutely clean. It is part of the Easter effect of what God does because of Easter. Let me read it to you. The Easter effect is so clear in Colossians chapter 2. It says this, when you were dead in your sins, and I, and I like to tell you, let me remind you, church, sins Sin does not make you bad, it makes you dead. All right, you're not a bad person because you made mistakes. You're not a bad person because you have sin in, in your life. No, no, you, you were created by God with purpose and value. The Bible says you are the object of God's affection and his love. He placed within you purpose, destiny, and his own nature lives with inside of you. Sin doesn't make you bad. God ain't looking at you, pointing your finger, saying, you're a bad boy, you're a bad girl. No, 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 sin makes you dead. That's the result of the nature of sin in our life. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charges of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed all powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You see, because of the plan of Jesus and because of the resurrection of Christ, you have access to the Easter effect. Write it down this way, that Jesus gives us access to God's power. You have access to power. Now, because of the cross, you have access to God's grace. But because of the resurrection, you have access to God's power. How I many you know you need both to walk and live victoriously in this life? You need to walk in God's grace, but you also need to walk in God's power. We need them both. We were, we were created to walk in God. And you don't have to wait to, for Easter to have a resurrection power experience. No, all you have to do is access it. It's, it's been available to you. And maybe you're here today, 
and you're in one of those steps of the substitution sequence. Maybe you're here today and you're just in that first step where maybe you've just chosen your own way and, and you've seen the results of that and, and, and th- it's just not working. Maybe even things are falling apart or falling through your fingers and, and, it, and it's just becoming more difficult and you're, you're, in, you're just right there. Or maybe you've already moved over, it didn't work out and you just started blaming people. You're blaming, you're blaming your spouse, you're blaming your job, you're blaming, you're just blaming your, your parents. Maybe some of you are even blaming God. It's God's fault now, and we're caught in this blame game. And then some of you, yeah, they are in that last step where you just feel today consumed by guilt. Just, just already that is weighing on you. No matter where you're at today, there is power available to you. Let me read you the rest of Luke chapter 22. Jesus didn't stop there. He said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet, he says, not my will, but yours be done. Now, if you're if you're willing to lay down your will and your plan, if you choose a savior instead of a substitute, you can access resurrection power today. That's yours. It's available. That's what Jesus did on day three. That's what he he accomplished for you is power. Resurrection power. So how do we access it? How do we access what God has made available to us in Christ's resurrection? Three steps to access it. Write them down with me. Number one, we have to accept Jesus' premise for salvation. Accept Jesus' premise for salvation. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, in today's society, no one's wrong anymore, right? You're not wrong. You can do anything you want. You can be anything you want. You can be anyone you want. You can be a puppy if you believe you're a puppy. You just be what you want. You just, there's just no one wrong. There's no wrong anymore. There's no morals or values. Just, it's just, there's just, there's just nothing wrong. But it, uh, can I tell you something? There, there is, um, and then when, even when it does, when something goes wrong, it's never an individual's fault, right? It's always society's fault, our government's fault, or it's, it's always someone else's fault. But the reality, friends, is we are broken, fallen sinners in need of a savior, and the substitutes are not working. Amen. The substitutes are not fixing the human condition of our broken, fallen nature. Here's what Hebrews chapter 9 says. It says, in fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That that is the premise of salvation, that sins have to be paid for. Let me say it this way. Sins have been paid for. It is finished. The record is canceled. The charges of our debt is done. It is erased. It is finished. Finish. Sometimes people ask, like, I can't believe in a God who would send people to hell for their sins. That's not what happens. God does not send people to hell. Hell is a place for people to go to if they choose to pay their own debt. But they don't have to because sins have already been paid for. See, hell was never designed for you. Listen, you were created by God with purpose, destiny, value, the nature of God, the power of God, the grace of God. Like God, God, cre- God did not create hell for us. Hell was created for Satan in his dominion of darkness. But hell, hell's a, you, hell's a place for people to pay their own debt. But you do not have to because the debt has been paid for. The record has been canceled. So what do we do? We need to choose deliverance. That's what we need to do. Hey, we need to just understand we are broken sinners. And we need a, we need a savior. I need to choose deliverance. How do you do that? How do you choose deliverance? Really simply here, Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that on the third day he rose, you will be saved. That's, that's it. That's, that's our choice. We don't have to pay the debt ourselves. It's already been canceled. You know why Jesus died on the cross? So you don't have to. That's why. So we don't, the sting of death, it's not our choice. Our choice is confess and believe. That's the first step in accessing resurrection power. In the Easter effect, you got to accept Jesus' premise for salvation. Here's the second step. We need to accept 
God's purpose for our life. Accept God's purpose for your life. You know what's going to get you through your day one and day two experiences? When you're, when you're kind of suffering or in trial or maybe even in delays, you know what's going to get you through? Purpose. When you know the reason why you're enduring. When you know the prize set before you. When you know where you're going. Yeah, that, that gives you per. When you, when you don't have purpose, I'm telling you, you'll look for a substitute. You will. It, and it's hard to see the purpose in the middle of some trials and struggles or even in the delays. But listen, God, is, God has your purpose in mind, not your preference. And thank God for that. See, you see your struggle, but God is setting you up because it's not always in your successes, but in your struggles that God shows you who you really are. Come on, somebody. And those disappointments are actually divine appointments in disguise. God is on the throne. Jesus is is alive. Do you know your purpose? Do you know why? Like, that's not supposed to be a mystery. It doesn't need to be a mystery. God can reveal to you why you exist why you are here on planet Earth. And so many people, I think they're trying to find their purpose in the wrong places. They're, trying, they're looking for purpose and value and significance in all kinds of places, and there's only one place you can find your purpose. One place. That's in your Creator. That's it. Ephesians chapter 1 um, says, in, it is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. May we, we find out our identity and what God has called us to do in Christ. Christ, part of the overall purpose, he is working out in everything and everyone. So what do we do? Pursue his plan. Start to pursue his plan. Here's the greatest part about pursuing God's plan. No matter where you are in the substitution sequence, God's plan for you has not changed. It has not changed. No matter where you are today, you're never too far and it's never too late. You say, oh man, you don't know. I've made some big mistakes. I've messed up big time. Look, what you have done doesn't matter in light of what he has already done. It is the Easter effect, you guys. It is accomplished. It is finished. And most people are living on one of three levels when it comes to your purpose. Most people are living on on three different levels. That first level, the lowest level of living is is what I call survival mode. And some, some of you are living on survival mode. You're just scraping by. You're just trying to, you're living paycheck to paycheck. You're living from from trial to trial, from difficulty to difficulty. You're just in in survival mode. The next level is what I call success mode. And 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 you might be successful by the world standards. You might have a little bit of money or you have you have some success, but it still leaves you unfulfilled. You know why? Because you were not created for success, you were created for significance. And that's the highest level of living right there, the significance of love level. It, 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 that is when, when you know who you are and what you're living for. You found it in Christ. You can access resurrection power by accepting Jesus' premise for salvation, by accepting God's purpose for your life. And then number three, by accepting the promise Jesus made. By accepting the promise Jesus made. Man, I think there's a misconception of those people that, are, that don't know Jesus or they're not Christians or followers of Christ. They think that, that, that following God and being a Christian is like a limited life. When Jesus said that I came to give you life and life to the full in abundance, man. Man, following Jesus is not a limited life. Following Jesus is a limitless life. I have unlimited grace. I have unlimited favor. I have unlimited power. Now, I am limitless in Christ. It is only I can reach my full potential in Christ. Now, this is, I'm telling you, this is where Christianity becomes so much from to me because his plan comes with his promises. Amen. Come on, turn to somebody and say, his plan comes with his promises. His plan comes with his promises. And what is it? What are his prom- What does he promise? Look at John 14, 12. Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. Wait a second, Jesus. Who are you talking to? You talking to me? Because you've been raising the dead, you've been healing the sick, you've been proclaiming uh, freedom to the captives. Me? I'm going to do that? I'm going to do what you have been doing? No, not really. You're going to do even greater things, he says. Even greater things than these because I go to the Father. So here's the last step in, in walking in resurrection power and taking advantage of the Easter effect. And that is we need to believe him for greater things. I mean, you were created, church, child of God. 
You were created for greater things. You can expect greater things because Jesus promised greater things. We forget not so much what Jesus did on the cross and what he accomplished on the cross, but we forget what he accomplished in the resurrection. Look what he accomplished, Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. It's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Like you can choose to activate this power. Like the Easter effect in our lives when we choose deliverance, when we pursue his plan, when we believe him for greater things, we have access to resurrection power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's the same power that brings healing to the sick, that brings peace to the anxious, strength to the weak, joy to the sorrowful, grace to the sinner, and life to the dead. That power is available to you. The moment you say yes to Jesus, it's available. It's accomplished. It doesn't matter how far you think you are. I'm here today to remind you not to underestimate the reach of the resurrection. You're not too far away from the reach of the resurrection. I want to submit to you this Easter that we believe that a resurrection can come in your life. And there can be a resurrection in your, in your finances, your marriage, your job, your dreams, your career, your health. Like it's available to you. Resurrection power. That's what was accomplished on the third day. Let me close with this scripture here. Luke chapter 17, verse 33. It says, if you grasp and cling to life on your terms, if you're choosing your way and it's got to be your way, you're going to lose it. But if you let that life go, you'll get life on God's terms. And I'm telling you, God's way is better. It's better. Let me tell you a story, quick story, um, a confession story. (laughs) Um, I haven't told it except here on Easter in in our Easter services um, years ago, when my first daughter was a toddler, Grace, um, my, my wife, she had to go somewhere, I don't know where she went, but she left me at home alone with my daughter. Big mistake. So um, I had her on her little play mat thing, and she had her toys. I left the room. When I come back in the room, I find her with a knife blade in hand, the blade part. And I, I freak out. You know, my first thought is like, oh, no, my baby. I start thinking what's going to happen here. But then my second freak out thought was, oh, no, my wife. What's she going to do to me? I had a picture in my mind handing back her baby armless, you know, like here she, I had a vision of it, you know, it's just, uh, so I, I immediately, you know, Grace, give me the knife. And she literally, she says, no, my knife. So I could, I have a couple options. I could, I could, well, option one, is grab and take that knife out of her hand. It would probably made a mess. It would have made the situation worse. Or I could get her to give me the knife. And so I remember we had some candy. I go to the drawer. I get some candy. And I tell her, I say, hey, Grace, if you give me the knife, I'll give you the candy. And she thinks for a moment with the knife. And I'll never forget it. She just opens her hand. She just opens it. And so I just gently walk over there, gently grab that knife from her, and put the candy in her hand. And, and can, I, can I tell you something? I tell you that because I want you to know that God sees the knife in your hand. Like God, God sees the pain you're in, the potential danger you're about to cause yourself. And he could come and snatch you out of that situation, snatch the knife out of your hand, but he doesn't. The Bible says in Revelation that he stands at the door and he knocks and he, and he, he just gently asks. And what is he asking for? He doesn't ask you to solve your problems. He doesn't ask you to fix your situation. He doesn't ask you to change yourself. He doesn't ask you to dig yourself out of the grave that you've been digging yourself. He doesn't ask. All he asks for you to do is open your hand. Give him the knife. Open the door and let him in. The Bible says he'll come in and eat with you and you with him. Here's how I want to close. As part of this kind of just this altar experience, you guys, you heard the word and now... Kind of let's respond to the word. Once you grab this card again, um, go ahead, everyone grab this card. There's this last part that says Easter response. Um, after the message today, this is like, where do you find yourself? You're in one of four categories, okay? You're in one of four categories. I'll, if you're a member here, if you're new here, everyone, even our volunteers dream team, get out a card and help me out, you guys. And, and let's identify what category are we in, A, B, C, 
or D. If you're in that A category, that means that you've already put your trust in Jesus. And a lot of you are in that category today. You're, you're a Christian. You're a follower of Christ. You've chosen his way. Man, you've, you probably chose your way a while ago, and you found out it didn't work. And now you're, you say, I'm a, I'm a follower of Christ. And I am his. And if that's you, check off A. Um, I've already put my trust in Jesus. The B is for those who are saying, I'm believing in Jesus today. Like, I'm, I'm putting my trust in Jesus today. Like, I, I was that guy, Pastor, that was choosing my own way. And I needed to change. I need a change. I need a fresh start. I was, that, I was in the blame situation. I was in, I'm overcome with guilt. And today, I want to be free. I'm putting my trust. I'm believing in Jesus today. If that's you, check off that B if you're ready for a change. All right? The C category is for the people that say, you know, I want to consider it a little bit more. I mean, I kind of like what you're saying, I, uh, but I, I'm not ready. You know, I just, I kind of want to just consider this church thing, Jesus thing a little bit more. And let me just say a little bit about this C category, if I can, you guys. And that is, I always dreamed about a church that, that was not for church people. I always dreamed about a church that was for the unchurch, that was actually for the C category people, people that were just on this journey of figuring it out, of trying to figure out their spirituality, make sense of things that they could actually feel comfortable in searching in this place. So if you're here and that's you, you, and you're wondering, like, is this a safe place for me to not quite believe yet, like not to be a believer, but to be searching this whole church Christian Jesus. For me, on my spiritual journey, I'm just considering things. Is this a safe place for that? The answer is yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, you don't, you don't need to believe here before you belong. You can belong before you believe, all right? So you are welcome, man. This church, we, is, we exist for the unchurched, all right? So if that's you and you just say, man, I, I'm considering, check off the C. The D category of people is a little bit deeper, and that's the kind of people that if you're that say, I don't ever intend on making that decision. Like, I was dragged here today. I, I, I have to go to church one time a year on Easter, and they make me come, and so I don't ever intend to make that. Just go ahead and check off that box. And some people ask, like, why would you want to know that? Well, a couple of reasons. I want you to have the guts. If that's you, man, just have the guts to put it down there. I want you to come to the grips, though, that that's where you are at spiritually. If that's where you're at, identify that that's it. then okay i don't i don't intend just just check it off and whether you like it or not i'm going to be praying for you i will i'll be praying for you because every year we have people in the c and d category that over weeks and months commit their life to christ every year every year we see it here so whether you like it or not i'm just i'm going to be praying for you um and so do me a favor find out where you're at if you're a a b a c or d check that appropriate category off fill out i'm gonna give you just a few seconds just to fill out some information again we're not going to call you hunt you down we just maybe update your information with us want to be able to pray for you and and know where you're at today so let me give you a few seconds just to finish that amen just go ahead and do that all right as you're as you're continuing to fill that out I want you to know this. I'm not, I, I want to tell you unashamedly that the reason, um, I, I really hope, unashamedly, I hope you all, every single one of you enjoyed today's service. I hope you enjoyed the worship, the music, the videos, the message, like every part of the service. I hope you just were, I hope you enjoyed it. But I want to tell you that we do everything we do around here for that B category of people. For those people that today that you're putting your trust in Jesus, like that is why we are here to lead people to love God, love each other, and change the world. And man, if that's you in that big category, I'm gonna, in just a moment, I'm going to pray. I want to pray for every single person. I'm going to pray for you, those of you in that category, and then I want to give you an opportunity to pray with me in and, 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 um, accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior. So let's do that together. Let's bow our heads all across this worship center. We thank you, Lord. Father, I pray for every person in this room. There are people here today that really need a change. They need you in their life, God. They need, they need a change in a relationship with you. They know about you. They know you exist, God. But they need something way more than that. They need resurrection power, God. God, I pray today that you'll give them the courage to acknowledge the condition they're in 
and to believe you can do something about it. There are some of us here that know your grace, that know what you accomplished on the cross, but are not walking in greater things and in resurrection power. God, and I pray right now that we would start to believe you for greater things, that we shall walk in power and authority and do greater things. God, help us elevate our faith, Jesus. There are some of us here today that are just today beginning to put our trust in Jesus. And I pray for them right now, God, that they're turning from their ways. They're, they're taking responsibility for the condition of their brokenness, for their sin, for their situation. God, that guilt, we don't have to live with it. It, it, it doesn't have to stay. Today, we want it removed. So if you're, if you're here and you're in that B category, can you just pray this with me? I want to help you with some words. Say, dear Jesus, Forgive me of my sins. Today, I declare that you are my Lord. I surrender my life to you. I ask that you take over. Holy Spirit, come live inside of me. Make me brand new. Change me. Give me the power, God, to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, church. Let's celebrate with all those making a decision today. Amen. Amen.